Good whisper. I'm super excited to have Dr. Mira Shaw on today with us. She's going to join us here in a second. And we're going to talk about all the fun stuff that I talk about all day long. I literally daydream baby making. And I know Mira does the same. There she is. I'm going to bring her on. She's from Nova IVF, not far from me. So it's super fun to have someone as passionate about helping patients in the most personalized way, like down the street. So we have fun together. So she's going to join us here in a second. Hi, Mira. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Dr. Amy. Good to be here again. Uh, it is so nice to see you. Okay, are you ready? We have so many questions. I want to make sure we get through all of them, including the live chatted questions. For those of you guys who don't know how to get your questions answered, it's easy. Go to askyagwhisper.com and you just put in your question there. And my producer, Paula, will email you when it's time for, your, for me to answer your question. So you'll know that that's the session that you'll be tuning into. And of course, I want you to tune into other sessions too. Okay, let's start. This question is from Myrtle. So Myrtle says, hi, doctors. You've answered a question for me before, and I'm so grateful for you. My husband had another semen analysis done through Meat Fellow, and his morphology is now at 0%. We have to do IVF, but our RE is not concerned at all. Should we be? We only have one shot at this, and I'm terrified. Dr. Shaw, what would you say to Myrtle? So um, the first disclaimer I want to make is that, you know, I obviously don't have all the information on this patient or any of the questions coming today. So right. trust your doctor because they know you best. Um, but certainly I will provide some insights um, as to how I would handle this case if I just mm -hmm. had the information alone. So the first point I wanted to make is that when we look at a semen analysis, there's a few parameters we look at. We look at the concentration of sperm, the percent that are modal. Um, we look at the volume of the ejaculate and we look at the morphology. And in my opinion, and I think this is science driven as well, the least important of all of those parameters to me is the morphology. There's actually really good data out there that if the morphology is 0% on a semen analysis and all other things are comparable between two semen analyses, it does not impact the outcome of the IVF cycle. So I wouldn't stress or panic about that. Now, if other things are also abnormal, like motility or concentration or volume, then I think potentially you really want to talk to your doctor about the use of ICSI, which is a way that we assist the egg to fertilize. Um, so, you know, definitely in, in cases where there's any parameter that's abnormal, I always refer uh, male partners to a urologist and I work with two very closely. And I really find that the semen analysis is a window into a, a man's general health. I've diagnosed everything from cysts to cancer in men just by looking at a semen analysis. So the bottom line for this patient is that an isolation, a low morphology or a 0% morphology should not affect the outcome of the IVF cycle. Can I ask you a personal question? Always. <laughs> Did you check your husband's semen analysis before you guys got married? Not before, but not before. After. Got it, yeah, I kind of did it before. So you guys, like if you are watching this and you're, you're thinking about freezing your eggs and stuff like that, or you're in the beginning stages of relationship, it's an easy test to do, don't you think? And it can save some people a lot of heartache too. Definitely. Yeah, okay. So now this question is from Lindsay. Lindsay is saying, thank you for all the amazing work you guys do. Here are my statistics. I'm 32 years old. My AMH is 4.88, TSH is 1.75. I have regu very regular 28 day cycles. I've never been pregnant. Husband statistics, 36, count 20 million active. I think total modal count is what she means. 9.3 million, motility 46%, grade three, meaning they're moving super fast, morphology. Again, 0%. It's like Lindsay is talking like Myrtle is talking. And this is what Lindsay is doing. She is planning her first egg retrieval for January with ICSI based on what you know, what supplements, what in doses would you recommend? What IVF protocol would you recommend? And what does my IVF pyramid look like? So first of all, Lindsay, just based on what I've heard, you have a great chance for success with IVF. Whenever I sort of am looking at the bigger picture, I'm looking at age and ovarian reserve, and those are the single most important predictive factors for IVF success. The fact that you're young, you're 32, you have an AMH of close to five, that predicts that you're gonna respond really well. That's great yeah. for you. Um, so go in very optimistic. The second thing is you know, your AMH, so a normal AMH might be somewhere between like 1.5 and three or four. So you're on the higher end of that. So you're at risk for potentially 
hyperstimulating. That means that a lot of your eggs are going to grow and there's going to be a lot of fluid shifts that ha happen in your body. And the recovery might be a little bit longer than it is for most patients. So there are a lot of tools that we have as REIs to help prevent really severe cases of hyperstimulation. And you should definitely talk to your doctor about that. One of the ways is by using a protocol called the antagonist protocol. The antagonist protocol basically starts off by taking the normal stimulation medications and about halfway in, you introduce an antagonist. An antagonist basically helps to prevent those follicles from prematurely ovulating. And the, the beauty of this type of protocol is at the very end, when you do something called a trigger shot that helps to mature the egg at the very, very final stage of IVF, we can use something called a Lupron trigger. The Lupron trigger really changed the game for us in the IVF world because before we had this trigger, we were seeing a lot more cases of OHSS or hyperstimulation syndrome. After the, the Lupron trigger was introduced into these protocols, we've really seen that go down to close to 1% or less. So I would definitely think about the antagonist protocol with the Lupron trigger for you, if you're a good candidate for that. Um, in terms of thinking about um, supplements, so Every REI, I think, has a different philosophy on supplements, and Amy, I'd love to hear yours too, but totally. I, I want patients to be realistic about how many medications they're taking. They're already taking tons of hormones and things like that, and I, I really just recommend, number one, a good prenatal vitamin with folic acid in it. Um, vitamin D has been shown to improve potentially egg quality, IVF outcomes, especially for patients who have low vitamin D, and that's extremely common. Um, the third thing is, you know, there are tons of supplements out there. I would say the one that maybe has the most evidence that supports potentially improving egg quality is coenzyme Q10. So you can take that 600 milligrams per day um, and the fish oil potentially. Mm -hmm. But I think to be really honest, you're going to get most of those nutrients and antioxidants from your diet. So really nutrition is the key as you get ready for IVF and also as you get ready for pregnancy and beyond. You want to be eating... Um, you know, I really believe in a sort of close to Mediterranean diet, decreased carbohydrates, decreased sugars, and moderation of dairy products, whole grains, fruits and veggies, decreased pesticide use, decreased, you know, um, processed foods. And all of that is really going to be the most important thing that you can do for yourself to help nourish your body, your ovaries, your eggs. Um, that's my personal take on it. Now, um, the final part was about the IVF pyramid. So um, I actually had to to look at look this up on your website, Amy, because um, I wasn't familiar with this. For those of you out there, I'm sure everybody follows your show and knows exactly what this is. But the idea here is that um, IVF is all about numbers, and those numbers are going to decrease as you go through every step of the process. So starting out with a good number of eggs is obviously going to give you the best chance that you're gonna end up with a good number of healthy embryos. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna depend on a woman's age and ovarian reserve. So I actually use something similar to the pyramid. I use the funnel concept. Mm -hmm. The funnel concept is kind of the upside down pyramid. Um, basically, you know, you start with, let's just say hypothetically, in your case, given your AMH, I would predict maybe 15 to 20 eggs potentially, or maybe even more. Let's just say 20 so that we can use a number that um, can help us do the math easier. Let's say, um, Lindsay, that you start with 20 eggs. Now, not every single one of those eggs or follicles rather that you see on the ultrasound are always gonna yield an egg at the time of an egg retrieval. So you might only see 18 or 19 of those. Now, most of those should yield an egg if they're size appropriate. From there, you're gonna see a percentage of those that are gonna be immature, but you're hoping that the majority of those eggs are gonna be mature. Mm -hmm. Mature eggs are eggs that are capable of undergoing fertilization successfully. So on average, we see that about 75% of mature eggs will fertilize. So let's say that 15 of your eggs fertilize normally. From there, your doctor might recommend potentially carrying those embryos out to the plasticity stage, which is five to six days after they've been retrieved. At this stage, um, the embryo has undergone several selection processes, so you're really getting the best of the entire cohort. But you're gonna see also about a 50% attrition at that stage. So starting from 15 fertilized embryos, you might only see about you know, six or seven blastocysts at the end. That would be average. Obviously, you can be above average or below average, but those right. are the numbers you go and expecting. Now, based on your age, those blastocysts 
individually have an excellent chance for success. So I would definitely recommend a single embryo transfer. And I think you have a great chance of getting pregnant within a couple of embryo transfer cycles. And hopefully being in a position where you can have surplus or excess embryos that you might be able to use for your second kid in the future. And that's the beauty of IVF is that obviously it can help women and couples conceive at much higher rates, but it also is a way to preserve your fertility so that hopefully you don't have to undergo these treatments again in the future. Right. And then she might have boat lo boatloads of eggs, right? I mean, with an AMH of 4.8. So she might also want to talk about freezing some eggs as eggs if she ends up with boatloads. Totally. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I love your answer. Okay. So this question is from Steph. Okay. So Steph says, I had my frozen transfer this last Saturday and my progesterone level was drawn that day. And today on Sunday, I got the level back. It was 15. So they increased my injection to 1.5 cc's, which is the equivalent of 75 milligrams. And then they'll recheck my level on Tuesday. And they say that, my, that they want my level to be at least 20. What are your thoughts? I just don't want to worry. Okay. Well, um, Amy, I'm, I'm curious to know what your cutoffs are in your clinic. And certainly um, different labs can have different cutoffs depending on what assays they're using. In mm -hmm. my particular clinic, we use a cutoff of 10. And so if the progesterone level is below 10, we will add or supplement additional progesterone. Um, you know, in your clinic, it might be 15 or 20. But, um, you know, an important thing to know is that blood levels of progesterone don't always correlate with tissue levels of progesterone in the uterus. So it really depends on the formulation and the combination of potentially vaginal progesterone and intramuscular progesterone. And so I, I'll have patients who are just taking vaginal progesterone who have low levels, but I'm a little bit reassured, more reassured because I know that vaginal progesterone going directly to the source probably is giving you much, much higher levels of tissue progesterone right. than you're gonna see reflected in the blood. But the bottom line is that um, I certainly wouldn't panic. Um, a level of 15, I would consider to be just fine. Um, but defer to your clinic and their protocols and their cutoffs. But I think you're going to be just fine with that. And this, is, and this is one of the reasons why doing an ERA test is helpful. So you're not panicked, right? So you go through this like practice run, you can check your levels and know what's right for your body because everyone's body is different. So while the ERA test might not change anything that your doctor would do for you as far as timing of the progesterone, it might get them to understand how you absorb progesterone and what the best regimen is for you because freaking out like after a transfer is done is kind of overwhelming. Yes, I yeah. then agree. And we have been, do, for those of you listening who are not familiar with the ERA, it's, it's a test that we can use to understand this concept of receptivity in the uterus where, you know, we, it's important for the embryo to be put into the uterus at a very specific time mm -hmm. for, a, you know, a subset of maybe 15 to 20 percent of women have a shift in that window of implantation. So putting that embryo in at that specific time for that woman will give them the best chance. Um, we started doing that just even before the first embryo transfer, because we know the stakes are so high for every single cycle for that patient. And there really isn't a big drawback to doing the ERA. Like you said, we learn about receptivity. It reassures us that we're doing the right thing with the first cycle. We want patients to get success right away. Um, right. And, and the first cycle, then it's, you know, definitely worth doing an ERA before that. I know it sounds offensive, but when a patient comes see me, I don't want to see her again, right? <laughs> I mean, I want them to get pregnant and be parents and not patients. So. I agree with you. Okay, so this question is from Grace. Grace is saying, hi, doctors. I love your show and look forward to hearing something new every time. My question is this. Can we predict the number of eggs that can be retrieved based on the estradiol level on trigger day? For example, a level of 2,085 picograms per ml on trigger day. What would you say to that? And she has two extra fault or two follow-up questions. I can just share them with you now. So her next question is, what about in vitro maturation? What do you think about that? And is there any hope that this can help a woman um, get more eggs that are mature from her IVF cycle? Okay. So the first question was about estrogen levels on the day of the trigger shot. So mm -hmm. what we know roughly is each mature egg secretes about 150 to 200 units of estrogen. So you might be able to sort of predict that based on an estrogen level of 2,000, you might get about maybe 10 to 12 eggs. But I think a better predictor of the number of eggs that you're going to retrieve is the number of follicles that your doctors are counting going into that last uh, ultrasound. And, you know, of course, some of the smaller follicles might not yield a, um, a mature egg, but any follicle that's really over 17, 18 millimeters has a great shot at, um, at, at yielding a mature egg. So that, that would be the, the best predictor 
um, in my eyes to how to predict how many eggs you're, you're going to get at the time of the egg retrieval. Yeah, I agree. And I kind of wish, you know, when we're doing ultrasounds, you know, as soon as you hit a follicle that's like 18 millimeters, wouldn't it be fun if like all of a sudden your ultrasound machine like started dancing and vibrating and shaking and like there'd be music and there'd be lights everywhere. Kind of like in the old days when you go to Cold Stone and you gave them a tip, they would start stinging for you. <laughs> I have those dreams. And then the other thing I'll just share with you, I digress. You know, like when you go to Chuck E. Cheese in the old days, you get all those tickets that would come out of the machine. And for me, I'm constantly printing out pictures for patients. because I want them to have pictures of their sparkling eggs. And I sometimes wish, I'm like, wow, I wish they could just take this and like enter it for a prize. Like, wouldn't that be fun? I should have something like April Fool's joke, where it's like, bring in your ultrasound pictures and you can pick out a prize. And I certainly know what prize I would want my patients to have. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so those ideas, I, I would totally buy. Oh, let's finish by um, answering the second. Oh yeah, for sure. The IVM question. Uh, Thank you. It was that uh, in vitro maturation is this idea that when the eggs are retrieved, we can assess them right away um, as to what they look like, what their potential is to fertilize. Mm -hmm. So we feed eggs on a spectrum starting from the, the most immature eggs, which are called GVs or germinal vesicles. Those typically don't have any potential to fertilize. Then the next step is metaphase one or M1 eggs. Those potentially could mature in vitro in the lab with potentially additional hours or maybe an overnight observation, they can mature by the next day. The most mature eggs, the ones that you really want to get the highest percentage of at the end of the cycle are the M2 eggs. Those are the ones that I mentioned have about a 75% chance of fertilizing. Um, in vitro maturation, it's really not well utilized across the country. There's a handful of clinics that do it. Um, there's not a lot of great data out there suggesting that it's a very effective tool. I mean, I, I have seen reports of live births and, and great outcomes, but I would say that the chance of doing that and, and the, the overall live birth rates are significantly lower as compared to you know mature M2 eggs. Um, so it's still in, in I think, in, the, in a research experimental phase, but. I'm really hoping that in our careers in the next decade or so, we're going to see that evolve and mature. And I certainly tell women that when we're freezing their eggs, at our practice, we actually freeze everything. We, free, we freeze GVs, M1s, and M2s. Oh, wow. we tell women that, you know, in the future, there might be a tool to mature these really mature eggs. Let's hold on to them just in case. Um, yeah. So, and, um, and then the last part of the question was, is there a hope um, for women who have a, a low maturity. And I would say um, that might be potentially something that can be modified in, a, in the following IVF cycle. Perhaps if we learned that a particular size follicle yielded immature eggs, I, for example, might push those follicles to a larger size, maybe two to three millimeters more, to try to get them an extra day or two of in vivo maturation before we extract the egg. So there's a couple of different things we can do. Obviously, that's one of them. Sometimes you can choose a different protocol, sometimes just entirely a different month, a different hormone profile, batch of eggs. You can just see completely different responses. So I always tell um, couples that if the first cycle didn't work out, Chances are the next cycle is going to look very different. One, because we've learned something about your first cycle that we can use to modify and hopefully improve your second cycle. Um, and like I said, every cycle is different. And I've seen just really, really remarkable differences. And I think that that gives me a lot of hope for women who have a poor response. They have a really good chance of having a better, better response the next time around. Right. And I agree because just because you have one cycle that doesn't work doesn't mean the next one won't. Right. I mean, Unless you have no mature eggs, no fertilization, no blast formation, or yeah. you have very poor quality blasts, you know, those are the things that you learn along the way. And even then you can still have a chance for pregnancy in another cycle. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. Okay. So this question is from SS and she says, love, love your show. Thank you again for what you're doing to empower women to be informed of their reproductive health. Can you explain how CoQ10, NAD, and PQQ are different and work together? I know on the show you talk about the benefits of CoQ10 and Neutrunage, and I added PQQ because that has also been discussed on many fertility foreman, forums, formans, I don't know what I'm thinking about formans, as being supportive of improving egg quality. What do you think about PQQ, Mira? So I personally haven't recommended it to my patients. Um, I do know that there's a lot 
that we could potentially improve on in terms of quality of embryos. And we know that as women age, um, obviously genetics are changing and there's more chromosomal abnormalities, but the cells are also aging from the standpoint of all of their cellular machinery mechanisms inside. So a hot topic in our field is mitochondria. Mitochondria is like the powerhouse of the cell. Um, it's what gives it the energy to, to do what it needs to do. And we have seen that cells that potentially have have aged have differing levels of mitochondrial content and they really need that to help in cellular repair mechanisms to potentially improve the quality of an egg to, to mature and fertilize normally so all of these medications that you've mentioned are addressing essentially different ways to optimize the the machinery the the all the mechanisms of inside the, the cell um, to help it improve its its functionality. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, Amy, because I haven't used it much in my practice. I, like I said, I use coenzyme Q10. Um, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, that's there's the most data to support that in terms of IVF outcomes. But I know you've had some great, um, you know, anecdotal kind of great outcomes with patients who've been on these supplements. So I'd love to hear yeah. what what do, you, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, back to what you said in the beginning. I mean, patients take so many things. I don't want them to be human pharmacies. I don't want them to be popping pills all day long because at the end of the day, do they really make a difference? I'm not sure. So I think the most important thing are the things that you talked about, a good prenatal with fish oil, vitamin D. I love CoQ10, NAD, and then something that's in the resveratrol family. So if I'm going to pick from a list, you know, could you take PQQ? Totally. Do I really think that, is it on my preferred list? It isn't, but if you want to take it, I think it's fine. But if I were to pick things to take, I would probably opt in for the CoQ10 with the NAD and something in the resveratrol family rather than doing PQQ, just because I don't want my patients to be popping pills all day long. Okay, we're on the same yeah. page. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this question is from Jade. Here we go. I have done one round of IVF and I got nine eggs. Six embryos grew to day three and two grew to day five. I did a fresh transfer and then a frozen. Both didn't work. Uh, I'm going to do one more cycle. I'm 42 years old now and have an AMH of 21.4 picomole per liter. So that sounds like she's not in this country, which seems high. I'm taking CoQ10 magnesium multivitamin. What advice would you give me that I should ask the doctor? And then she also asked, what are your thoughts on embryo Blast Gen Media Suite. So what do you think about those levels, 42 years old, and what she shares with us? Okay. Well, the first thing is, um, sorry that your, your transfers don't work. That's really disappointing. Um, that can be really discouraging. But there's something that I really um, like about those numbers, which is your AMH. Now, I had to do the conversion, um, because as you said, we don't use those units here in the U.S. But um, converting it, I think your AMH using our units would be around three which is great for you at your age. Um, you know, yes, your age is, is a challenge in terms of the number of healthy eggs that you might have remaining, but you still have healthy eggs left. And the fact that your AMH is as good as it is means that you're a really good candidate for IVF. And if anyone's gonna be successful at IVF at 42, it's gonna be you. Um, so, you know, nine eggs, I would say, yep, that's sort of maybe on par with your AMH. Potentially, I think you have the potential to even do better than that, maybe with a different protocol, a different month. Um, and you did have some embryos go to blastocyst. So that's, that's certainly good news for you. Um, I think, you know, after anyone's failed to transfer, I would certainly begin to explore uterine causes as well as embryo causes. And we talked about already the ERA test um, that can help us understand something personal to your body, which is the timing. The timing is everything. Um, so I would recommend doing that test for you before another embryo transfer, um, potentially even doing a test called the Receptiva test, which can help us understand whether there's any um, endometriosis or endometriosis-like markers present that could potentially alter the environment of the uterus to make it you know, um, not as friendly to a, an embryo. So there, there are some things you could potentially optimize from a uterine standpoint. Um, but that being said, I, I think that, you know, doing another cycle, if you have it in you to do it, again, you are a good prognosis patient with your AMH. So I would say definitely go for it. And um, I wish you the best of luck. In terms of the embryo culture media, I'm not actually familiar with that. What I would, would say is that any patient 
doing, you know, looking around, doing their research about different clinics should really ask the questions about, you know, in terms of the lab, because this is such a critical part to your IVF success. Obviously, we're important, but I think they're just as important, if not more, because they're handling eggs, embryos, thaws, freezes. All of that is so critical to success as well. So I would ask the clinic, if you're concerned about the, the, t the types of media that they're using or, you know, what are your fertilization rates? What are your blast rates? Um, you know, and, and see if they sort of line up with the numbers that we talked about before. If they're below those averages, then potentially that could be concerning. But again, you want to see about a 75% fertilization rate of mature eggs. And of those, you want to see about a 50% blast rate. Your numbers aren't too far from that from your last cycle, having, um, I think you said you got nine eggs. I don't know how many fertilized, um, but based on those numbers, if maybe four or five fertilized, and I would have expected about two blasts. Mm -hmm. But I think um, that's an important question for every patient to ask um, their clinic when they're, when they're looking for the right fit. Exactly. What does your pyramid look like? What does your funnel look like? Why are you using the medications that you're using on me? What do you expect from me? How many cycles should I do to achieve the goals that, that I want? All really important questions. And I know you do PGTA as well. What would you recommend? Would you recommend for someone who's 42 to consider PGTA? Well, I think it, um, I'm very selective of, about who I recommend PGT to. And I want the audience to really understand that it's not black or white, yes or no, it benefits mm -hmm. everybody, it doesn't. Um, and I think when I'm deciding about PGTA, I really inform my patients about what the risks and benefits are. So it's a great tool when you have the luxury to select from a bunch of embryos. If you have a lot of embryos and you're trying to select the best one, PGTA can help you do that. But let's say you just have one embryo and you could still do PGTA, but if that's that patient's last cycle um, and they're not gonna be able to do any more IVF and maybe they're thinking about using a donor or adopting, then I talk to them about the, the, the potential to transfer that embryo without doing PGTA. Um, because, you know, we were practicing IVF well before PGTA and we had great outcomes. Obviously, it can help improve the live birth rates. It can help reduce the miscarriage rates. And there is a lot of benefits to PGTA. And I think in your case, with a good AMH, and for most women over 37, 38, I think there's a clear benefit to doing PGTA. Um, I would say yes. But let's say, for example, your embryos don't grow well in vitro, and maybe you don't make any blasts. In that case, there may actually be a potential benefit to not doing PGTA and potentially doing a transfer even before the embryo gets it gets to the blastus stage. Uh, the point of this whole thing is not to confuse um, the, the followers here, but it's just to really understand that there are a lot of complexities to PGTA. There are limitations like the, the fact that we're only biopsying, you know, a couple of cells out of an embryo that is several hundred cells. Is that representing the entire embryo? We don't know. We believe that there's probably pretty good concordance, but it's not 100%. And there are clinics out there who are transferring mosaic embryos and having great pregnancy outcomes. Yes, great. I'm so glad you're, you're doing that. We just recently started to do that, especially for couples who, again, are thinking about the next path being donor or, you know, another option altogether. You know, this is a chance. And of course, you have to really look at which chromosomes involved and have them speak to a genetic counselor. But I think um, if it's done thoughtfully and really with the patients informed about the risks, then you know you could do that. And so the bottom line is that I, I really feel that PGTA is um, most effective for women in their upper 30s and 40s and who have a good ovarian reserve. So therefore, they have a good number of blasts to test. Or the last thing I would say is someone who's gone through a miscarriage because of a chromosomal abnormality. Obviously, mm -hmm. that patient has, um, you know, a lot of uh, trauma-related feelings related to going through that pregnancy loss. And so to minimize that risk, I think that there is a benefit to doing PGTA. Yeah, so I love it. So you also just kind of outline what your clinic's policy is for reporting mosaic embryos and transferring them. And not every clinic is transparent about that. And in fact, they turn off the reporting from the side of the genetic testing company so that patients aren't made aware that they didn't even have the option to find out which embryo is mosaic or not, which frankly is totally wrong. And I have a huge problem with that. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's very important and very important to me. <laughs> Okay, so this next question is from Leah. So Leah says, hi, doctors, I love your show. Could you please explain what is causing 
uneven follicle growth. And she says, greetings from the Netherlands. <laughs> Great. I hope you're joining today. Um, so in terms of uneven follicle growth, first of all, this is really common. Um, it's because when we start a stimulation, not every single follicle has the same amount of receptiveness to the hormones that we're giving you. So the main hormone of IVF is FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. And these little follicles have little receptors on them that are essentially reaching out for that FSH and then growing in response to that. Some follicles may not have as many receptors. Other follicles may have tons of receptors. And so um, what we love to see in any cycle is a nice synchronous cohort growing all together, but we don't always see that. When I don't see that, it could be one of two reasons. One, it could be a primary egg quality issue that we can't overcome even with a different protocol or a different cycle. Um, it might just mean that intrinsically, some follicles are gonna have more receptivity to the FSH. They're gonna grow faster. Um, but some of the, the, the tools that I use when I've seen a prior cycle look kind of dimorphic and some follicles were small and big. And those are so challenging because for us, we're trying to essentially find this sweet spot where we don't want to let the big follicles get too big, but we want a chance at those smaller follicles to be mature. So we're kind of balancing and trying to find the best time to, to trigger. Um, but what I do sometimes do is something called estrogen priming, which is in the cycle prior to the stimulation when FSH levels actually naturally start to rise. You want to kind of slow that down by giving the woman estrogen in the luteal phase that can help prevent that rise in FSH. The other thing sometimes I'll do is just a birth control start where, again, same concept, the birth control pills are kind of quieting the ovaries, allowing them to sort of have somewhat of a level playing field before you really start to stimulate. So some of those things might help, but I will say I've done those things before and in some women, they will still have a very, very dimorphic response. And I think that speaks to more of their egg quality. So you, you said something that was so funny, I mean, in a good way, I was thinking of like little follicles as like Venus flytraps, like little insect eating plants, you know, but not insects, our eggs don't eat insects, but they're like eating up the little FSH. Yeah, that's how I Anyways. picture it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so this question is from Kristen. So Kristen just asked, I just completed my second egg retrieval. My second round, I changed from an aggressive antagonist protocol where I took 175 units of Metapure, 300 of false, and 100 of clomid, dexamethasone with 10 days of omnitrope. <sighs> that is pretty aggressive. To a moderate, 225 Metapure, 100 milligrams clomid with dexamethasone with five days of sazon. I had eight eggs retrieved, seven mature, five fertilized, two blasts, but uh, both came back abnormal. The first cycle, let me tell you about it. I had seven retrieved, five mature, four fertilized, and no blasts. I'm 40, DOR, AFC 5 to 8, AMH 0 0.4, three miscarriages, conceived my three and a half year old naturally. How many more rounds would you attempt? And then she asked more questions like, would you bank embryos? How would you change my protocol? Have you ever transferred abnormal embryos to see if they could self-correct in utero? What do you think, Mira? Okay, well, again, sorry that you have gone through so much treatment, so much hormones, it takes a toll on your body over time. And the decision to do more IVF is a deeply personal one. And I think we have to factor in a few variables. For me, when I'm talking to patients, I am gauging where they are at emotionally, um, where they're at to a certain extent financially, um, and the toll that it's taken on their bodies. And so the decision to do more IVF and where we draw the line to kind of say that they've done their best is highly, highly variable. Now, for some women, they say, gosh, IVF was so easy, didn't have any side effects, I could definitely do this again. Um, and as long as I think there's a shot at it, absolutely. You know, for so many couples, it's so important to have their own biological kids. Obviously we know donor egg can be a plan B if that's something that a couple is open to, but for so many people, we wanna just give them the best shot. And two cycles at age 40, given that you do have diminished ovarian reserve, yes, I would definitely not lose hope and try again, especially because you've had a couple of cycles and you know eight retrieved eggs, seven retrieved, that's not bad. Those are decent numbers and all you need is one. You know, all you need is one. And when we're talking about, you know, age and statistics, I, I think at 40, um, I've had so many patients in their early 40s with diminished ovarian reserve 
who are successful with IVF. It often takes more than two cycles though. And that's just the reality of it. Um, I think after each cycle, you have to regroup. You have to say, gosh, it was devastating to have, go through all of that, you know, no normal embryos, kind of just check in with yourself, see what that was like, talk to your doctor and see, do they think it's worth it? And if you were my patient, I would say, if you have it in you to do it again, absolutely. Um, and uh, I wouldn't lose hope. If you're open to egg donation and maybe you have limited resources, um, certainly I think that's something we wanna explore sooner rather than later. But if that's not on the table, then absolutely doing at least one or two more cycles I think is very reasonable given um, all of your numbers. Now in terms of um, the protocols, my personal opinion about protocols is that um, they can certainly help in some ways, but what really is the primary uh, determinant of success of that particular cycle is the cohort of eggs that you have to work with. It's, it's, it's that by itself. And so the protocols can help maximize how many of those actually grow and when you trigger can potentially affect how many of those are mature. But how many eggs you have to begin with is really dependent on the number of eggs that you have to start with. And that's gonna vary month to month for women. So I think, Amy, you and I practice similarly in this way in that in the month that we're thinking about doing an egg retrieval, we check the FSH levels. Right. And that's not something every clinic will do, but what I've found is that that can vary so much, especially in women with diminished reserve. You can have a cycle where your FSH is eight, and, and the next month you can have an FSH of 14. You're gonna have very different responses in those two months, and you can, in a lot of ways, predict that beforehand um, by knowing what that FSH is. So I will often tell patients that, if I know they have the potential to have a better FSH, let's wait a month. Let's try to get this FSH down to maybe below 10 before we invest a lot of time, energy, resources into stimming. Um, the last part was about transferring abnormal embryos. Every clinic has a different policy on this. In our clinic, um, we certainly are, are open to, to transferring mosaic embryos, depending on what chromosome, the level of mosaicism, um, and certainly the, the counseling of a genetic, a, a genetic counselor is really, really important. Um, I know that there are ongoing clinical trials. In fact, Stanford has a, tr a clinical trial called TAME, T-A-M-E. I think it stands for transfer of abnormal and mosaic embryos. And so patients can enroll in this study. And um, again, assuming that they've gone through genetic counseling, they can undergo an embryo transfer depending on the type of abnormality that that, that embryo had. So, you know, different clinics have different policies, but I would say that a lot of clinics are now open to doing that um, and definitely more open to doing that because there's been a, a, a lot of body of literature that supported great pregnancy outcomes with mosaic embryos. Right. I'm right there with you. As far as transferring abnormal embryos, I've never had one self-correct. And, you know, I feel like there are so many different uh, platforms for genetic testing of embryos. So I just know with the company that I typically use, I, I have tried to transfer abnormal embryos for people who just want a chance and I've given it to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there might be a day and I actually have someone pregnant right now with an abnormal embryo. We just haven't reached the stage where I can shout it out at the top of my lungs. I did it. I transferred an abnormal embryo and it turned into a normal pregnancy. It's a little bit too premature, but it wasn't the platform that I used. It was at a, an embryo from a different clinic. That clinic wouldn't transfer the abnormal embryo. And so I, I gave her a chance. So that's tune, in, tune in next time and we'll see what happened. Well, I can tell you, Amy, that's, that's so, so happy that you gave that patient a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because most places would not. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how many patients I've had come to me after they've done tons of IVF at other clinics where um, they always did genetic testing and they always had abnormal embryos. These are women over 40. And um, I've had countless pregnancies now where we've either opted out of genetic testing or potentially done like a day three embryo transfer. Mm -hmm. And um, it just goes to show that I think we're, we're limiting opportunities for patients when we do genetic testing, because we know that there are false positives and false negatives. That's why all you know, not all genetically, sorry, not all embryos that have been genetically tested will result in a live birth, but we know that on both ends there's errors. And so I think um, if we're thoughtful about which embryos to transfer and how we go about PGTA, 
we can give that patient a chance when they may not have had one otherwise. It's so true. I call it the murkiest crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. That's what I call it. Okay. So this next question is about royal jelly. And when patients ask me about it, I'm like, it sounds so fancy. So her, Jackie's question is, does royal jelly help male and female fertility? Also, is it safe to take during the IVF cycle? What would you tell a patient who asked you that? So I personally um, don't have a lot of familiarity with royal jelly. I don't know if you do, Amy. I, I do know that it's an, it has antioxidant properties. And we know that antioxidants are really important for um, making good quality eggs and sperm. Um, I, when I did a quick lit search on royal jelly, I saw that there was a lot of studies on in animal models, but I didn't see any in human models. So in general, if I haven't seen good human data, I tend to sort of avoid things where we just don't know if it potentially could have a negative impact. It doesn't seem that way. So again, I, I would say that you're going to get most of your antioxidants from the things that you eat and consume in your diet. Um, so that's what I would focus on rather than, you know, doing all these other things that we potentially don't know the impacts on egg and sperm quality. How do you feel about it, Amy? I say no royal jelly. <laughs> I said, I want you to take all the other stuff. You can stop taking the royal jelly. I've okay. never been impressed with it. I've never been. Bee pollen, royal jelly. Again, I'm like, oh, so fancy. No. <laughs> I mean, if you want to take it, you can. But it's not on my list of to-dos. Okay, this question is from Talia. I just had my second failed IUI cycle. During my day 10 ultrasound, my lining was 4.2 millimeters. I had a large follicle, 24 24.5 millimeters. They had me triggered that night. I'm wondering if my lining was too thin, if that contributed to not working. Everything I read points to yes. My doctor said it's fine. What would you say? Okay, so the thin lining is this very interesting, um, I would say controversial, um, sort of, I think, debatable topic in our field. I would say that what we do know is that Women get pregnant with linings of four and five. I've, had, I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do know is that at least in the IVF world, we don't know too much about IUI. Um, but in the IVF world, we like to see linings that are over seven and eight millimeters because we know that linings under six are associated with lower implantation rates. So um, I, I would say that first, when I have a patient with a thin lining, I want to understand if there's other things we need to explore. So I would definitely investigate the uterine anatomy, either by doing a saline infusion ultrasound where we put fluid in and see if there's any scar tissue or anything else that's impeding the growth of the endometrium. Um, the gold standard way to evaluate the uterus is a hysteroscopy. Um, I don't think that that's unreasonable in repeated thin linings. And in and, and a hysteroscopy procedure, you can actually visualize the lining, the tissue, and if there is maybe a, a band of scar tissue that might be there from potentially an old pregnancy loss or maybe an infection, you can actually very, in most cases, treat that and remove the scar tissue and allow the endometrium to then grow um, better. But what I will say is that there was, a, there was a study that I looked at fairly recently that looked at um, Clomid cycles and letrozole cycles with uh, thin linings, and um, they were sort of trying to ask the question of should we cancel a cycle just based on a thin lining and the answer was no the outcomes of those cycles were actually equivalent even in those cycles where the lining was thin and we know that clomid thins the lining so that's actually a known effect and impact of the clomid on the endometrium but what i would say is the first thing is to explore are there any fixable correctable causes for a thin lining um and uh begin there but i would say that we do know, at least in the IVF setting, that low, thinner linings can be associated with decreased implantation. And I bet you would agree with me, no more Clomid for her. So if she was taking Clomid, probably yeah. she shouldn't. And then maybe add a little something, something, like a little estrace. I bet uh, you would do that too. Yes, I, I yeah. definitely would in, in, in my practice would add that in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I wouldn't, and I wouldn't worry. I agree. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, okay, so this question is from Erica. Hi, doctors. I'll be 36 next month, and I just had my first IVF cycle. I have bilateral adhesions on my fallopian tubes and a history of ovarian cysts. Do I have endometriosis? Go into your crystal ball, Mira. Okay, I'm going to share with you some of her stats. Here we go. AMH 1.8, FSH 5, estradiol 49, semen analysis, 10 million total modal count, Kruger morphology, round one to three, during monitoring, seven follicles on the right, five on the left. Here are the retrieval results. Here we go. Three eggs collected. 
three mature, all fertilized, two blasts, both abnormal, one complex abnormal, and one had trisomy 18. Husband had a varicocellectomy two years ago. They've been together 12 years, never pregnant, started acupuncture two months ago. She switched to a paleo diet, no soy, no dairy. Also just started all the recommended supplements. What now? Should I do more IVF? Should I consider mini IVF? Help. Thank you so much. And I love watching your show. What do you think, Mira? Well, Eric, we're working really hard. And, um, you know, all of our patients are, they're, they're, they're trying to do everything they can to make this work. So I commend you for your efforts and I hope that they're going to pay off for you. You certainly deserve that. Um, what I will say is um, the first thing is uh, uh, your question about endometriosis. Endometriosis is, is a surgical diagnosis. And so to, to be made with confirmation, you actually, and actually we used to do this um, not that long ago, we used to do laparoscopies on all women because endometriosis was so common. We saw it in almost half of all the patients that we saw. Um, it, sort of, it's, it sort of causes all of these effects on the sperm, the egg, the receptivity. And, um, but what we did learn is that by doing the surgery, we're, we weren't necessarily always improving the outcome, which is why we stopped doing them on everybody because obviously surgeries have risks. Um, to answer your question, I don't know if you have it. What we do know is that, you know, a blocked tube or like a cyst on the ovary that looks like a clear endometrioma, which is when endometriosis infiltrates the ovary, then I think our index of suspicion goes up quite a bit. But, you know, scarring of the tube certainly could also be due to a prior um, infection. And we know certain things like chlamydia and gonorrhea do cause um, tubal factor infertility. So, but I wouldn't necessarily that. The other thing that clues me into endometriosis is whether you have painful periods, whether intercourse is painful. Um, and those things could, again, lead me more towards a diagnosis of endometriosis. So that's the first part of your question. The second part was about your response to IVF. So the first thing I would note is that there's a little bit of discordance, in my opinion, between your AMH and your egg count. So with an AMH of 1.8, um, I would have expected more than three eggs. I would have expected maybe close to maybe eight to 10 eggs at least. So we have to sort of understand potentially what happened there. Was it that, you know, how many follicles were there going into the egg retrieval? Were there close to eight to 10 and then only three were retrieved? Or were there only three to begin with that stemmed the entire way through? But in either case, I would recommend um, a different protocol um, altogether um, and, and hopefully a different cycle, maybe a lower FSH, um, a different protocol potentially could yield a much better response. And I certainly think, certainly think you have the potential for that with an AMH of 1.8. If that AMH was from a couple years ago, it's worth rechecking that though, because I do find that in some women, the AMH can drop pretty precipitously over a short period of time. So if your AMH is now 0 0.5, that could explain this outcome and potentially can help um, set expectations for you a little bit better as you go through um, potentially another cycle. Um, but the bottom line is for you, Erica, is again, you're a young patient. To me, you're a young patient. Most of my patients are, again, upper 30s, early 40s, and it's, it's slightly different in terms of thinking about the percentage of eggs that are healthy for you. Um, because at 36, I've had, again, so many patients with diminished reserve, maybe we, we only got a couple of eggs every cycle, and maybe it took more cycles to get to the end goal, but we almost always eventually got there. And that's what's good news for you, is that your age is favorable for you in terms of your genetics. So even if you don't get a lot of eggs, um, you're still over time, over potentially a couple more cycles, likely to end up with a healthy embryo. So I encourage you to, to keep going, keep trying, because there's reason to be hopeful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think repeating the AMH will be helpful. And then looking at the protocol very carefully, because it's possible that they over suppressed you, maybe you're very sensitive to estrays, and you tried estrays priming, or they put you on birth control pills, and it just shut down your ovaries, or they will put you on birth control pills, but for like, you know, three or four weeks. So that can happen. And that can make it harder for your ovaries to wake up. Okay, Mira, are you guys ready for us to answer your chatted questions? Are you ready, Mira? Here we yeah. go. Okay, let's do it. Dear doctors, it's a common to have a cold sore near the mouth a few days after a frozen embryo transfer. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, if you're prone to cold sores, having a transfer is stressful. So it could be common for you. But I mean, it. but you're right. It's not common. It, it's not related to the hormones or it's not anything you have to worry about. But yes, we're all under a lot of stress yeah. with going on. So I wouldn't worry about it if it's something new that you've never had before check it out with your primary care doctor to make sure it's not a, a, a new lesion that needs to be evaluated. Yeah. And no. would you be okay with a patient using an antiviral like a Breva or something like that? Yes. 
Yeah, me too. Okay. My happy place is asking us, what is the most common thing that couples do with their leftover embryos once they have all the kids that they want? What do your patients do in your practice? Wow. Um, well, a number of things. Some of them will donate their embryos to research. And um, that's wonderful because that's how we're advancing the field um, is by looking at human embryos and studying them. So there are um, research institutions that will accept donated embryos. And that's, that's a really nice Thing to do. Um, the second thing is that they'll just discard them. You know, they, 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 they feel more comfortable with just discarding the embryos. The last thing that um, some couples feel more comfortable with is something that I call a compassionate embryo transfer. They um, don't want to sort of discard it. They don't want to donate them. They want it to sort of go back into their body, but at a time when implantation would have a 0% chance of working. Um, so there, there are some couples that I've taken care of that have done this. And um, so you have a lot of options, but the good news is that you're, you know, you, you're in that position to, to make that decision. So I congratulate you on being successful with IVF and even having that option open to That's you. That's true. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this next question, how can women with endometriosis increase their chance of IVF? success specifically. Wow, success and specifically are not two words that I should ever read together. At FET time, what mm -hmm. are your endometriosis tips for IVF success at FET time? Okay, great. So um, we know that endometriosis can have an impact on the, the receptivity and the uterine lining. So a test that, again, is part of my workup for um, getting everything optimized prior to the first embryo transfer the ERA and the receptiva test. The receptiva test is um, checking for markers that are linked to endometriosis. And so I would suspect that your receptiva test would be positive. If so, there is pretty good evidence that suppressing with Lupron and Letrozole, actually combined, can improve the overall uterine environment to make implantation rates significantly higher. <clears throat> so this would involve potentially six to eight weeks of Lupron suppression. And I have seen that work wonders in my patients. Now, if your endometriosis is debilitating and maybe you have endometrioma cysts or you, know, you have very significant pain that's uh, you know, affecting your quality of life, then I think you might wanna go down the, the surgical route and go to a specialist that does surgery specifically for endometriosis and have that cleared up because that too has been shown to improve implantation rates. So either a surgical route or a prolonged down regulation with Lupron and Letrozole can improve your success rate. I agree. Okay, next question. I have an AMH of 10. Is that abnormal? And would hyperstimulation be a risk if I chose IUI? What do you think? So it depends on your age. If you're 22 years old, an AMH of 10 may not be you know, that high. We know that younger women are going to have a higher ovarian reserve. But assuming that you're probably somewhere between, you know, 30 and 40, um, then yes, that is a really high AMH. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a problem. It just means that you have a lot of eggs, which is good news for IVF. Um, if you also have irregular periods, then it's probably a sign that you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So um, I would definitely, um, you know, want to do additional blood work and, and, and confirm that diagnosis. The other way that we diagnose PCOS, in addition to looking at ovarian reserve markers and um, menstrual cycle you know, patterns is by looking at androgen levels like testosterone and DHEAS um, and DHEA. So those things can lead you towards that. Now your risk of hyperstimulation is going to be high. So your doctor should, first of all, counsel you about the risks of doing IVF and the risks, you know, the, the symptoms that you're gonna experience going through it. Because even though we might be able to minimize the severe forms of hyperstimulation, we're not gonna be able to take away from the fact that your ovaries are gonna get really big. So you're gonna feel bloated, you're gonna feel uncomfortable, but the key here is that we wanna minimize all of that fluid shifting that happens as a result of the medications that we give you that can um, you know, increase the risk of OHSS. So again, what I talked about before was the Lupron trigger. That is really, really, really key for you to, to minimize the risk of really getting the severe form of OHSS. Mm -hmm. So this question is about progesterone suppositories. Would you ever use it or tell a patient to use it with a sperm-friendly lube so it's easier to go in? I um, haven't. I, if, if you use something, I recommend using, you know, water. Um, you know, I, I don't recommend any lubricants because I don't know if it gets as well. I don't know, Amy, do you, um, are you okay with using lubricants and suppositories? No, I just tell them to use water. 
Is that, yeah. I mean, if you really need to, to get one in and you're doing IUI, fine, because we know you ovulate it and your body's going to make it too. Right. With IVF, I say, no lube for you. <laughs> That's sort of what I say too. Yeah. And do you tell patients to lie down afterwards if they're using it? Let's say endometrin. Do you have patients lie down? I don't. Um, I tell women to sort of take it, well, you, well depending on the dose, it will usually be done twice a day or three times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if you're using it at night, obviously you're going to be resting afterwards, but I don't, you right. know, the vagina is like a sponge. It is absorbing that medication right away. And some of it's going to come out and some of that was sort of what the capsule was coated with and that's okay. And that's why we check progesterone levels in our office to make sure. Yeah, I agree. Are you there? Are you there? Oh, there you are. Okay. We'll just answer a few more questions. Um, maybe like 10 more minutes. Is that okay, Mira? Do you have the time? We'll yes. just keep going through them. Okay. How important is it to check the ingredients of daily skincare and body wash products for preparing for pregnancy and during the early pregnancy? Many things. Yes. So um, the only thing in certain skin products that, that potentially could pose a risk is anything with retinoic acid, um, which is sometimes used for the treatment of acne and severe acne. Pretty much everything else is safe. So um, talk to your doctor about the specific ingredients in your products, but in general, it's okay to take most of them as long as you're not, you know, there's not a risk for the retinoic acid in there. Yeah, I agree. And there's a really cool company called Million Marker. You guys should check it out. Mary, you should check it out if you haven't checked it out yet. They do a, a cool environmental toxin, like a uh, questionnaire for you. Then you, you send in your pee and then they tell you what you've been exposed to. And then you can repeat the test after you've changed your exposures based on the products that you use. So it's a really cool test out there that I've been dreaming of for like my whole life. I've been like, if I could invent a test, this would be a cool test for us to do. And finally, someone invented it. Okay, next question. Uh, my happy place. That's her name. I'm 33 years old. I want two kids. I have three good PGS tested embryos. My doctor's recommending another round of IVF, but I'm afraid to have too many embryos. What do you recommend I do? All right. So um, the first thing to know is that what is the success rate of each of those embryos, assuming that they are good quality. So when I say good quality, each of your embryos gets a, a number and two letters. And so if you're talking about AAs and AB embryos, then those have about a 65% chance of birth. Perfect. That's pretty good. So in general, I tell patients two genetically normal embryos per child desired. So obviously we, we would want you to have four. Now in your specific situation, if you really want to avoid IVF at all cost, what you could consider, first of all, do all the tests up front to make sure that your first transfer is going to have the highest chance for success. So ERA at the very least, make sure your uterine cavity is perfectly optimized and that your health is optimized for the transfer. Um, what you could consider doing is do the first embryo transfer. If it's successful, great. Now you have two embryos left over for number two in the future. But let's say the first cycle failed. Now, you know, you're going in to potentially your second transfer with, again, best case scenario, if that works, so you're only going to have one embryo left. So I would say to you, if you're really trying to avoid at all costs, do one transfer first. If your outcome is great, I think you're set, you're fine. But if it's not, you might want to consider doing another egg retrieval just to be on the safe side. Yeah, I agree. I'm right there with you, especially for my patients who are over 40 and they've done, let's say, two egg retrievals and they have two embryos. I'm always like, get another one yeah. just so that we're not upset that we didn't at least have that conversation. So this question is from uh, Leaf and it's, hi, Dr. Amy, asking for a friend, 33 years old with an LH of four, FSH of 9.5, trying for three years. What would you suggest? What would you recommend? IVF, egg freezing? So this is someone who's been trying to get pregnant for three years with those levels. What would you say? Did you mention their age? 30. Okay. 30 years old. So we know that you've been trying for a long time. Um, three years is a long time. There, there's something going on there. You need to at least get an evaluation, make sure it's not fallopian tubes that are blocked. It could be a male factor. Those are the most common things that I find in young patients who have a long history of infertility. Of course, if you have irregular periods and that could, you know, be it as well, but um, you want to first get an evaluation. Now, if it ends up being that there's a maybe a, a male factor or your tubes are blocked, then IVF might be the best route for you. But if the sperm counts check out okay and your fallopian tubes are open, you're young. So I would at least give you the shot at a couple of IUIs before moving on to IVF. Um, we do know that the duration of infertility um, does predict sort of outcomes with treatment. The longer the duration, the lower the success rate. So I would really set expectations at IUI for you, assuming all things are working normally, would have about an 8 to 10% chance of success. So 
maybe about a third of my patients will get pregnant over three cycles, but that means two thirds of them don't and have to do IVF. So again, just setting those expectations up front is important. Um, of course, you have a shot at IUI working and avoiding IVF I know is important to a lot of people who don't wanna to have to do all those hormones and injections. Right of that you're young, assuming you have good ovarian reserve, and that's something I would definitely have checked out, get your AMH checked out, check your follicle count. If those things look really good, I think IOI is not unreasonable. Again, assuming sperm counts and fallopian tubes are open. Um, if your ovarian reserve is low, however, it might lead me to potentially move to IVF sooner. You could still try IUIs, but I might not try as many cycles before moving on to a treatment that's gonna work better for you. Mm -hmm. I agree. And someone else just asked a question very similar. 26, FSH is 10, AMH is 2.9. Do you think I should do IVF so I can freeze some blasts for the future if I want four kids? We're currently trying naturally for the past six months. I imagine it's pretty similar advice. Yeah, and, and, and family planning goals are like the first question I ask every couple because you know, if you want one kid versus four kids, the conversation is going to be very different. Four kids, you're, you're 32, I think you mentioned. So that means at best, you know, nine months of pregnancy, one year of breastfeeding, just let's just say two years between each pregnancy, right? Um, you know, you might be 32 now, 34, 36, 38, you're going to be in your, um, you know, high 30s when you're hoping to conceive your third or fourth kid. Um, and so yes, it's going to be much more challenging to conceive naturally at that point. So yes, I, I think you can never be too secure with, um, with anything. And, and by doing IVF and freezing some embryos, you're gonna set yourself up for the highest chance to have four biological kids. So, you know, if it's something that you can, you know, take the time to do, if it's financially feasible for you to do, um, I would absolutely recommend it. Yeah, and I've had people do it. I had, I can think of a family right now. She came to me when I think she was 32, wanting four kids. This was back in like 2008 and we did the work. It wasn't easy, but we did it. And she had decreased ovarian reserve at the time. So it took, I think probably six cycles to get her enough embryos. And she's on, she's, she's had her four kids. That's yeah, Amazing. people do it. Okay, this question is from Mallory. She says, hi doctors, I have a syndrome and I'm gonna be going into my first IVF cycle. What are some tips? What are like some three top tips, piece of advice you'd give someone who's never done IVF before that mm -hmm. would potentially like equip them with like really good information? What would you tell them? Okay, great. So IVF can be really daunting for the first time. So the first thing you want to do is just get prepared for it in terms of having self-care tools to help you go through the emotional roller coaster of the hormones and the ups and downs of the entire cycle. Make sure that, you know, I recommend to patients that, you know, they exercise, that they have support groups, that they have potentially um, people who can help support them through the entire cycle. Maybe it's therapy, maybe it's, um, you know, exercise. Just find your self-care package to make sure that you're really disciplined about taking care of yourself as you get ready. Um, the second thing is just go in with the appropriate expectations. I think that is where patients really get um, burnt out in treatment is that going into it, um, not knowing really what the success rates are for them. So it's really important to get educated and informed. And I mean, Amy, you do incredible work and workshops I know on egg freezing school and preparing for IVF. So all of those tools are great for patients to get ready for it just by understanding what the potential outcomes can look like. I really like Fertility IQ. I think they have some awesome modules where it walks you through the entire process, um, the statistics, the sort of the side effects, the risks and balance uh, benefits. And, um, you know, of course, talking to your doctor about them too is really important. But I would say sometimes your doctor doesn't have time to go through every single thing. And sometimes they can't really be as emotionally in tune with you as maybe a support group or somebody who's been through it. Um, so I think that's really important as well. And I think just finding, um, you know, just staying optimistic throughout the whole thing and, and finding um, ways to sort of keep your spirits up throughout the whole cycle, I think is really, really important. I think this journey is often not linear from A to B. It's up and down, it, you know, especially in our current climate, we've got a pandemic, the election's crazy. You know, there's so much going on that I think we need to just take care of ourselves and be hopeful that there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel, which oftentimes there is for people going through this process. And that's, that's a great advice. I mean, I often tell people the mental health part of this journey is the, the part that people don't talk enough about. And we should be including that in every new patient consult. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? <laughs> How's everybody doing? And figure out a way to make sure that people are 
going to be emotionally prepared for what I call an adventure. <laughs> adventure. Yeah. <laughs> adventure. Well, Mira, thank you. We've been on for over an hour and you guys asked such wonderful questions. We so appreciate your time today. Dr. Shaw from Nova IVF. She's not far from me and I just adore her. She is so much, has so much, um, great information for us. So if you guys want to see her, you know, go to her website. No, uh, wh wh what's your website? Can you just get, call so it out for us? Nova IVF is our practice. We're in Mountain View. So NovaIVF.com. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram. I'm dr underscore Mira Shaw. And you can, I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. Feel free to send me a, a message and I would be more than happy to, to, to chat with you. And um, Amy, I just, I love how we're aligned on so many things. Yeah. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share, um, you know, insights with your audience. And I think you're doing incredible work by educating and empowering women on all things fertility related. So thank you, Mary. Well, you better come back on again. We'll, we'll, <laughs> I'm going to hold you to it. Anytime. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Everyone have a great night and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Mira. Thank Appreciate you. you. Bye-bye.